Hello and welcome to uh, lecture 2.5 in this online cognition series. Uh, we will be talking today about the neuropsychology of uh, visual recognition. Primarily we'll be talking about object recognition. Uh, the reason I talk about this in this particular course is it illustrates so much about the pattern recognition process um, that fits in with some of what we've already been discussing. And so I think it's really appropriate uh, to talk about what we can learn about the cognitive process by looking at uh, the brain itself. In particular, we're talking about individuals with different kinds of recognition disorders. So uh, we're going to start with uh, an introduction to different kinds of visual uh, object recognition uh, disorders or recognition disorders. Uh, then we'll then talk about uh, agnosia and different types of agnosia. Then we'll talk about prosopagnosia. Then we'll talk about um, a disorder called topographic agnosia. And then we'll move in and talk about what the implication of this is and then talk about global versus local processing in the brain. So agnosia is the inability to recognize objects. And we'll talk about this in more detail. But individuals with agnosia can no longer uh, recognize objects using their visual system. And so they can look at an object, um, and they won't be able to tell you what it is. And so we'll talk about the various um, ways in which this manifests itself. This occurs primarily due um, to strokes. So it's usually some sort of brain injury, but it's almost entirely um, due to strokes. Uh, anomia is the inability to name objects. We'll talk more about this when we get to language later on in the term. Um, but it's appropriate to talk about here uh, because an individual with anomia can look at an object and tell you something about it, but can't give you its name. So, for example, if they were looking at a, a set of keys, they could say, I can't remember what they're called, or I can't, I don't know what they're called, uh, but you might use them to unlock your door or to start your car. So, this indicates that while they recognize what the object is, they can simply not find the name. And anomia itself simply means a lack of nouns or, or no nouns, loss, or loss of nouns, something like that. Uh, finally, prosopagnosia is an inability to recognize faces, and we'll talk in more detail about this. Um, prosopagnosia is another fascinating case um, where individuals who have this disorder, primarily again um, caused by stroke to what's called the fusiform face area, uh, there is a developmental version of this as well we'll talk more about. Um, but what's fascinating about this is individuals with uh, acquired prosopagnosia can still usually recognize people that they know, but they do it by recognizing their voice or the way they move or talk or something, some specific feature about them um, rather than recognizing their face um, itself. And then we'll talk about uh, topographic uh, or agnosia here in a bit. So let's start with agnosia. Agnosia is not a disorder of the senses. People with agnosia have uh, generally uh, normal intact vision. Uh, they can see perfectly fine, hear, see everything. Uh, it's also not a memory disorder. That is, they have not lost their memory. They simply cannot um, visually recognize things in their environment. So uh, to sort of illustrate this, in this rather blurry uh, <laughs> um, photograph we are um, figure we have here, an individual with agnosia will look at these keys and cannot recognize them visually. But once she picks them up, she can actually recognize them. So that's the other thing about agnosia is you switch to a different uh, sensory system, you can recognize them, which is why people with prosopagnosia can recognize people based on their voices. Uh, whereas this individual who has lost his knowledge um, of what keys are, we can pick him up, do anything with him, and he has no idea what to do with them. So he's lost his memory, whereas she has simply lost the ability to recognize things based on her visual system. Um, so as I said, it's not a disorder of the senses, not a memory disorder. It's usually limited to one sensory modality. Um, so generally we're talking about uh, visual agnosia. Uh, when we get to language, we'll talk about um, whole word agnosia, um, I think it's called whole word agnosia, uh, or whole word deafness, um, where people can no longer recognize um, words, and we'll get into that later. Um, but that's when we get to language. Right now we'll stick with talking about visual disorders. Uh, so there are two really different, or three different, 
uh, versions of agnosia we'll talk about. The first of these is the most disabling. It's called aperceptive agnosia. And this is a basic disruption in perceiving patterns. Uh, these patients lose the ability to take the basic visual information and form any kind of pattern. So remember when we talked about um, feature theories, we talked about recognizing individual features and putting them together to form a pattern and then recognizing that pattern. Uh, these individuals with a perceptive agnosia are able to perceive only small local aspects of stimuli. So one of the things um, we often do with um, neuropsychology patients is ask them to copy line drawings or uh, copy other sorts of drawings. And so here we can see on the right uh, an aperceptive agnosia patient's attempt to copy uh, these um, objects. And so what you can see is they focus on individual features. They can't form a whole perception and so they're drawing only one thing. So here it's this angle uh, they know this has to be curved. Uh, they seem to get the keys or the teeth part of this key, but not the rest of it. So they can't copy even the most basic forms. Um, another uh, aspect of this is they tend to limit their um, processing to local features. So they would see these individual lines. They would not be able to put these together to form a word as we can because uh, they only see uh, individual features. So they would actually see this as 7415 because they can't visually combine these elements to form the word this. So pretty fascinating. So that's a perceptive agnosia. It's this inability to put together uh, a visual stimulus into a coherent uh, visual perception. Associative agnosia, uh, these patients are able to construct a mental perception so they can get past that step. Um, however, they're, able, they're unable sorry, to associate that perception with its meaning. So they can get the um, form together, but they can't then go to the next step. So um, we'll take a look at uh, some line drawings from an associative agnosia patient. And this really fascinates me because they can copy a line drawing better than I could, uh, but then can't tell you what they've just drawn. Um, so here we have um, line drawings from an associative agnosia patient. Pretty good copies, frankly. Like I said, better than I could do. Um, but they cannot tell you what they've just drawn. Um, the, I've seen some of these kinds of drawings, in particular this train here with an aperceptive agnosia patient, and they'll just draw like single wheels or single features. Um, I've seen them draw a face with just nothing but noses. But this associative agnosia patient certainly can gather the whole perception, uh, but they can't identify what these objects are. So what this illustrates again is these patients can get through the first step, that drawing the perception together, the, those visual features, into a whole perception. They can't then go to the next step, which is identify it with its meaning. Finally, uh, we have what's called category-specific agnosia. Uh, these patients are unable to recognize only a single category or class of objects. It tends to be uh, fairly strange, so things like living things versus non-living things that so they can identify chairs but not dogs or dogs but not chairs, that sort of thing. Sometimes it's even um, as uh, highly specific as musical instruments. They can recognize everything else but not musical instruments. Um, so this illustrates uh, a little bit about how this information is stored. So it tells us that we store information about our world based on what it is. So we categorize these things uh, in the visual system as well. Well, I want to turn next and talk about a couple of other rather unusual um, instances of um, recognition uh, difficulties. And this is prosopagnosia. And prosopagnosia is an inability to recognize faces. Um, there's a really fascinating book by Oliver Sacks called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. And the uh, title story essay in that uh, particular um, collection is about an individual with prosopagnosia. Um, unfortunately for Oliver Sacks, he actually developed prosopagnosia later in life as well. 
So uh, this can be due either to um, brain damage, usually a stroke, or more rarely it's a developmental condition. So um, developmental prosopagnosia, um, they really just never develop the ability to recognize faces. So the damage to the brain in these patients is uh, in the fusiform face area. Um, and neuroimaging data in um, healthy patients uh, without this kind of damage, so this is the fusiform face area here um, at the bottom part of the temporal lobe. Uh, and you can see that here, right here, at the junction between the temporal, this is what we call the temporal, temporal occipital junction. Um, and this is the part of the brain that seems to be active during um, facial recognition. If you are interested in sort of testing your own face memory, um, there are a number of ways you can do this, but there's a, a link here to uh, facememory.sci.uwa.edu uh, in which you can take a face memory test. There's also, I think, the Cambridge face blindness test. Um, and you can find these online. And so you can actually go and do that if you're interested. Uh, so the final stop on uh, these disorders of um, recognition is topographic agnosia, and this is damage to what's called the parahippocampal place area. Um, so the parahippocampal place area is uh, designed or tuned to recognize landscapes and scenes, so both indoors and outdoors. Um, and individuals with uh, damage to this area can have what's called topographic agnosia. And these patients can no longer recognize familiar places and landscapes. And so they lose this ability to recognize places they ought to know and find very familiar. Um, this appears to be due, uh, according to the literature, uh, an inability to match the surroundings they're looking at with stored representations. So again, we're talking about a disconnection between the perception and their knowledge. Um, I took this uh, figure from uh, the very brilliant uh, Schwartz and Krantz uh, Sensation and Perception textbook uh, that I highly recommend if you're interested in this area. Um, and so here you can see uh, this parahippocampal place area is right here uh, in the interior part of the temporal lobe right next to the hippocampus. Um, and so you actually get um, loss of the ability to recognize landscapes. Uh, they've also highlighted what's called the extra striate body, and this seems to be uh, the part of the brain uh, for recognizing um, body parts, so, um, which is rather interesting. So to kind of summarize all of this, uh, here we have again the um, body area, the parahippocampal place area, the fusiform face area, and this um, area in here is apparently where our ability to identify things is. So um, pretty a uh, fascinating group of, of uh, brain areas involved in telling us what things are. So all of this uh, is uh, taken together uh, to be called what, what we call the what pathway. Um, and this is also often called uh, the ventral stream. And so there are uh, areas involved in facial recognition, um, color perception, et cetera. Um, in this sort of object recognition area. And again, we call this the what pathway. Um, it, it took me a minute to try to think about um, the parahippocampal place area and whether or not it was a what or a where thing, but it is, trying, it is a recognition um, uh, aspect. Uh, so it is telling you that you recognize a landscape, even though that really is kind of a where thing. But in the where pathway, we're more concerned with um, where things are immediately in our visual environment. So we'll get into that here in a moment. Um, so the what pathway is also again known as the ventral stream because it's here at the ventral side of the brain. Um, and we uh, see this in brain imaging studies and agnosia patients. They both provide converging evidence for this idea of this kind of what pathway. Um, the where pathway, which apparently um, we will talk about when we get to um, talking about um, attention, so our visual attention in particular, is uh, called the dorsal stream. Um, and so the dorsal stream is on the dorsal side of the brain, um, and we'll talk about individuals who lose their ability to perceive motion, a disorder called akinetopsia. Um, we'll also see that our visual attention can be directed to specific locations uh, in that uh, ventral pathway. Uh, and uh, what's interesting about the ventral pathway, sorry, the dorsal pathway, <laughs> 
uh, which is the uh, where pathway. The dorsal pathway is the where pathway. The ventral pathway is the um, what pathway. Uh, in the dorsal stream, you can identify what things are based on their movement. So things that are moving, you can still identify what they are. Um, and so these aren't entirely independent. So it's not all what and all what all where. Um, but there is some combination of these visual streams. And again, we're going to revisit this question uh, when we talk about attention uh, in the next module. So I want to talk a little bit about the implications of agnosia. So let's start with some key findings. Um, first thing we know is that detecting features is a separate process from the sensory process. Um, and that detecting those features is critical in constructing a pattern. There's a separate step in linking the pattern with its meaning and then with its name. So our associative agnosia, or sorry, our aperceptive agnosia patients uh, show us that detecting features in their combinations is one step. Then, um, so constructing that pattern, so aperceptive agnosia patients cannot construct that pattern. We also know um, from uh, brain research that there are specific feature detectors in the brain, so we know that's um, done in the occipital lobe. So then from there we go to uh, taking that pattern and associating it with its meaning. So associative agnosia patients cannot associate the perception with its meaning. And then finally there's an additional step uh, in taking that meaning and associate it with its name. And we know that from anomia patients. The implication here is that pattern recognition is hierarchical. Um, and it fits in entirely with the feature theories we've talked about uh, previously. So this tells us a lot about how the brain is accomplishing pattern recognition and it fits entirely with the behavioral data we've talked about previously. So the final note in this area is um, some interesting work on uh, visual field and uh, global versus local processing. These are what are called Navone figures. And um, you can see on the bottom these H's form an E and then the M's form an A and then up in the top of course we have pluses and a moon and stars and a heart, etc. If you present these figures to the left visual field, so left of our um, fixation point, that will of course go to the right hemisphere. Uh, participants will identify the global features. So they'll identify the moon, the E, the A, the M, the heart, the star. If we present them to the right visual field, where they go to the left hemisphere, um, we get a focus on local features. So this tells us a little bit about how the brain is accomplishing some of this kind of pattern recognition by looking at local versus global features. And it's a really interesting part and a really clever way uh, to look at that kind of um, pattern. Uh, so some summaries from some uh, other textbooks in this area. Uh, Marie Banich has a terrific textbook in uh, uh, cognitive neuropsychology and neuroscience um, with some really great summaries of the what uh, pathway and deficits in object recognition and presopagnosia. Uh, some suggested readings. Uh, Martha Farah has some really great book has a really great book uh, called Visual Agnosia, um, and uh, I highly recommend taking a look at that. And of course, um, Oliver Sacks' book, uh, The Man Who Stuck His Wife for a Hat, is also another terrific read. Well, thank you. Uh, in our next module, we're going to turn to talking about attention, and I will see you then.